Hello, good afternoon. So my name is Proskovia. I am a doctoral student at SSA, and um, I have a pleasure to introduce to you uh, of our next uh, panelist. Um, and they'll be presenting on the work from the field. So the first pre uh, presenter is uh, Juliette Siban. Uh, she's a research and evaluation advisor for economic interventions uh, at the IRC. Um, in her position, Julia works across technical units and countries uh, to support the use of research in IRC programs and the design of implementation of research. So we are very happy to have you. And then our second uh, presenter is Leila Karemli. She, uh, her research uh, focuses on youth poverty and the financial behavior of youth, their asset accumulation, and their social networks. Um, in her dissertation, uh, Leila used data from the Suri Maka study. Uh, to examine the savings performance of the poor children enrolled in Masaka, uh, in, the, in the study in Masaka and Rakai. So, please, take over. Okay, how do you feel? Good? <laughs> okay, it's the end of the day. I just come from New York. I have only one hour difference, and I already feel tired, so I can't even imagine all of you that came yesterday from the other part of the world. So if you want to take some coffee or move during the presentation, I won't feel offended. Go ahead, I know we have to wake up at that time of day. It's the last session of the day, um, and then you have a discussion. So I'm from the International Rescue Committee, and I'm going to present on a project that is called, if it works, like this. How should I do that? OK. Oh, I think someone in the back is supposed to put the presentation. OK. So it's OK. I'm going to start without the slides. Um, so I'm going to present on a project that is called New Generation, and that was found by, uh, funded by USAID and the Displaced Children and Orphans Fund, DCOF. Um, it started in 2009 and finished in 2012, and so the final report was released last year. So the project is happening in, happen in Burundi. Um, as you may know, Burundi is a country which recovered from decades of conflict and um, is one of the poorest countries in the world with around 70% of the population living be below the poverty line. Here we go. So that's a map of Burundi. And um, I want... So it's a, yeah, a country, a country that recovered from decades of conflict and um, especially had a lot of refugee uh, populations that came back to Burundi. So I think since 2003, it was an estimation of 500,000 people coming back to Burundi after having um, escaped the country during, during conflict. So in this context, um, children face numerous risks to their development and well-being, and the intervention that I will present today was uh, aimed at addressing this risk. Uh, we implemented, as the IRC implemented the project in two regions of uh, Burundi, which were particularly hit by the, by the conflict. So the project includes two interventions, an economic intervention and a parenting intervention. So the economic intervention is a village saving loans association. So I don't know if you're familiar with this intervention, but I can explain a bit more later if you have some questions. Basically, it's, it's a group that comes together every month and uh, save, and then uh, people can, can take a loan from the group savings. So um, the intervention, this intervention is, is a basic village and saving loans. Uh, grouping intervention is they had like the groups and the standard VSLA trainings that explain how the groups work, and also an entrepreneurship and financial education training. So that's the economic component. And then the family-based uh, discussion sessions that we also call a parenting intervention was 10 discussion sessions related to child protection and well-being in the family and community. These sessions were um, developed for the cultural context or in, in Burundi uh, through formative research, but the curricula, the, the, it was inspired from curricula that are also used in the, in the US. So why these interventions to um, address the risk faced by children? 
The first one, the economic intervention, I mean, the assumption behind this is what, why we're all here today, right, is to say that poverty is a strong predictor of child well-being and development, so if we address economic needs, we could have an impact on child well-being um, and, and protection, so that's the rationale behind this e economic piece. Then we could have chosen another economic intervention, and I think at that time when it started, it was 2009, VSLA were seen as very prom promising in economic intervention. We didn't talk about cash transfer so much at that time also, and I mean, there were debates, so it could have been another economic intervention. That's the one that was chosen in, in this project. Um, and it was also interesting for the IRC to say, uh, how can we build evidence around, uh, around this intervention? And the second one uh, on the parenting, the, ide the idea behind this was uh, there is some strong evidence that parenting intervention have an impact in the US um, and, and in other European countries, but there were no evidence in conflict uh, settings, which are the, the area where IRC work. So we, we wanted to take this opportunity to also test, is money alone enough, or we, if combined with the parenting intervention, can it have an impact, et cetera. So that's the rationale behind choosing these two. The research questions that we try to address through this intervention and the studies that was, came be with it. The first one was, does a VSLA intervention improve economic outcomes of poor household? Right, so the, just looking at the economic piece, so the economic intervention and economic outcomes. And then the second piece was, do family-based programs improve children's well-being beyond what is explained by increased well economic well-being, or is money alone enough? So I think this really relates to what was discussed before. What is the theory of change that we have in mind? Do we think that economic intervention is enough, or do we think that combined with other intervention, it could work better, combined with what? So that was the type of questions that we were asking ourselves when we started this project. So the evaluation strategy, um, nothing fancy, it's just like a randomized controlled trial. It's, there's two columns because uh, there's two faces. So basically you have a baseline survey, right, with everyone before you start the project. So the baseline survey, um, IRC went in, in different communities and identified potential VSLA groups. And there, was, there were 80 groups that were identified at the baseline survey. Then uh, these groups were randomized between a treatment and a control group. The treatment was the first uh, block, VSLA and VSLA plus the family-based discussion session, and the control group was receiving nothing in cycle one. So basically you have two different treatment and a control group. So that's, that's cycle one, then you had a midline survey, and then in cycle two, the first two groups, the ones that were treatment in cycle one, just were supposed to continue functioning with, with minimal support from IRC. And the control group became, again, was split into two treatment groups, VSLA or VSLA plus family discussion group. So what this allows you to do and why we chose to do this, so first there is like an ethical concern within the IRC of offering the program to everyone at some point. So this has... Uh, pros and cons, right? In research, it means that at, after cycle two, we didn't have a control group anymore. So you're not able to measure the impact, the long-term impact. Um, everybody was receiving something, but because you have two different treatments, you can compare VSLA versus control, VSLA plus versus control, VSLA versus VSLA plus, etc. Um, and the sample size, as I said, was 80 VSLA group and uh, 1,500, 1,600 households. Um, so I'm starting with limitation. Normally we put this at the end, but I feel like because we never have time to talk to them, we just don't talk about them, and I think it's important. So uh, the first one, and it's not specific to this study at all, is just the fact that all our measures are self-report and sub, uh, potentially affected by what we call social desirability bias. So what it means is just that sometimes people just tell you what they want to tell you, right? And, it's, and I think we didn't talk about it in the previous presentation, but with all the outcomes that relates to sexual activity and, um, you know, things that NGO or the program that you just received tells you to do one thing with, um, tells you to do one thing and then they come back and they ask you the question, did you do that thing? I mean, there's many discussion to have around um, what could be the bias of this. So again, it's not specific to this study, but I think it's worth mentioning. The second one is uh, what was also mentioned before was around the measurement. So we used scales that were adapted 
um, locally in the formative research. These are also pros and cons. The pros are that they're contextually valid, but also we can't really compare them with other studies, and so it was, um, it, it, yeah, it is a shortcoming. Then very quickly, attrition, this is also in, in many studies, you don't find all the households at the end of the, of the project, that was one issue in this context, and the other one I already talked about was that we didn't have a, cu a pure control group until the end. So uh, quickly, this I won't go into the number, but it's important to look at process indicator when you have an economic intervention, but also other type of intervention. What actually happened, like did the VSLA work by itself? So did people put money every month and did they actually took loan? So let's say you don't look at this and you just look at impact and you don't find any impact, maybe it's just because the system didn't work itself. So it's just really important, the monitoring data and the process data. So what this tells you is just that the VSLA were effective in terms of people actually taking loan and uh, in terms of delivering the basic financial services. Then the question is whether this had an impact or not. And so the answer is that the VSLA intervention had an impact on economic outcomes, which is the first purpose of uh, an economic intervention. So it had an impact on per capita consumption, asset index, and spending uh, for children on education and clothing, um, so which led to poverty reduction. So I can go deeper into these results, but basically the bottom line is that the VSLA intervention had a significant impact on household economic well-being. Then we can talk about size and what is, is this result meaningful, but it, it has a significant impact. Uh, the second one is that we didn't want on only this, we wanted this to translate into child well-being outcome, and this actually didn't happen. So the VSLA intervention on its own had no clear impact on caregiver practices and child outcomes. So I didn't explain the, what, was, what were the outcome exactly, and we can talk about it more because I have only one minute left. But, um, but basically, we only found um, some impact on what we called family problems, which were like alcohol use and... Um, uh, within and conflict within the family, but nothing on, on child discipline or child well-being um, outcomes. So one thing that I didn't talk about here, but for this, we could only use the cycle one data, and, and we think that the power could have been a bit low to actually see some impact there, but yeah, we can, but basically we didn't find any significant impact. And then the last one is uh, impact of the family-based discussion on child outcomes. So just remember, it's, it's not family-based discussion versus nothing. It's family-based discussion, uh, the added value of family-based discussion on VSLA only. And so according to children, uh, at the first cycle, we found some improvement, but uh, we didn't find them still after the second cycle. And according to caregiver, the main thing on which we, the main outcome on which we found significant impact was harsh physical and verbal discipline. This was a strong significant impact, and, um, but no significant impact on other parent-child communication, child well-being, child labor, and child, child mental health. So um, the, it's, it's also, um, it goes with previous results on, on this type of programs. It means that the, I mean, the more direct outcomes that you can change when you work with parents is what parents actually do. Uh, and then you can think about the next step is what happened to the child. So we think that it's already a first step to have reduced this behavior, and, but then it didn't go through the next step. So I had some results here. So conclusion is that um, the VSL intervention had an economic impact, but no clear link to family or child outcome. And the family-based intervention influenced caregiver practices, but no child outcome according to caregivers. I'm taking 30 seconds more. Um, there, there can be a lot of discussion around this. At the IRC, we discussed a lot around right it, what it means for us. Was the increase in income too small? Did we didn't wait enough time to see some changes? Is alleviating poverty not enough and we need to combine with other intervention? What type of intervention? Then we worked a lot. We have an other research on family-based intervention on how we could improve, what didn't work this time. So happy to answer any question or um, other thing. I'll stop here. Hi everyone. Tired? Yeah. 
All right. Um, I like uh, I like Juliet's comments about nothing fancy, just a randomized control trial. <laughs> that was my my favorite part of her presentation, and it was a wonderful presentation. Um, I'm actually more excited to discuss it <laughs> more than. Okay, I'll try to be very fast because I know everybody is tired. And um, uh, okay. All right, so my name is Leila, and um, I had the privilege of working with Professor Suwamala, whom we call Dr. Fred in Uganda. And um, I uh, worked with him for five years, and I used his data set for my um, dissertation. Let me see here. Okay. Um, so we've already talked about the assumptions behind um, Professor Subramala's studies, which is um, acid-based approach to poverty reduction, and the assumption is assets promote not only economic but also um, psychosocial well-being, and this has been tested um, extensively by Professor Subramala, by Professor Leila Smilova, by Professor Mary McKay, and by a whole bunch of other people and colleagues who worked on this, and um, there's another assumption that uh, poor people uh, can save if supported by, um, and actually do save if supported by institutional structures. Now, this is what I was interested in. As a result of um, um, participation in subsidized matched child savings accounts, do people really save um, as it's claimed? And um, I want to probably start by clarifying um, and going back to the earlier uh, point about the economic empowerment, there is a whole bunch of um, economic empowerment, a whole range of economic empowerment interventions, and um, the specific economic intervention, economic empowerment intervention that, that I'm talking about is the child savings accounts. And uh, um, as, uh, and, and I'll go further, I'll, I'll, I'll go in more into details as um, used in, in Professor Subamala's study. So uh, we're not talking just about the youth savings um, product. We're talking specifically about the child savings accounts where um, children and their families are offered an opportunity to save, um, uh, to, to open up an account. They're offered uh, incentives. They're offered with information in the form of financial education. And there are specific uh, withdrawal restrictions uh, on the amount you're, that you're saving. And um, uh, there is a uh, facilitated a uh, facilitation in, in getting access to financial education. So I really want to emphasize that um, I'm not testing the effect of any kind of economic uh, empowerment intervention, and I'm not even testing the effect of any kind of um, youth saving product. I'm specifically testing the effect of participation in child in this type of um, uh, subsidized matched child savings pro program. And um, so I'm, uh, I was asked to present um, the results of my um, dissertation, and um, and then another piece of advice that I received from Professor Mary McKay is that if I present all my results, then you know um, it will be too long. So I decided just to focus on maybe one main thing, and um, my overarching aim uh, was whether participation in, as I said earlier, in subsidized match child savings program, did it change savings attitudes. And did it, it, did it produce um, a change in financial asset accumulation? And when I say financial asset accumulation, it's a very fancy term, I mean saving. And I'm talking about uh, saving attitude and um, savings by uh, school-going orphan adolescents in, in Uganda. Um, and the specific aim that I'm presenting today is whether um, the intervention had an independent effect above and beyond of the individual and family characteristics. Because we all know that savings attitude and, and, and saving behavior can be affected by uh, a variety of individual level characteristics and family level characteristics. What I'm interested in to see whether the um, intervention um, um, had an independent effect above and beyond uh, individual and family characteristics. And um, I will not um, overwhelm you with um, theoretical background. I just want to draw your attention that it was a, um, I kind of think I took the interdisciplinary approach because um, I did, uh, um, I dived into literature from classical and behavioral economics, from fina family financial socialization, and of course the institutional theory of saving. Uh, that was developed by Professor Sheridan, and I had the privilege of having him in my dissertation committee. <laughs> and um, okay, uh, again, uh, 
the outcome measures that I'm specifically interested in researching is uh, saving attitude, uh, measured as reported willingness to save, and a reported confidence in saving money. And another outcome that I'm interested in is financial asset accumulation, which is a self-reported saving. Do you have any money saved anywhere? Yes, no. And if yes, then how much money do you have saved? Um, so let me, um, I don't want to overwhelm you with all the details of, of analysis. What I want to draw your attention is I'm testing the effect of a particular intervention. Professor Fritz Subamala was a, a the in, the, this intervention study was uh, funded by NIH and Professor, Professor uh, Dr. Fred is a, um, is a principal in investigator for this intervention. And the intervention um, is and uh, offered opportunity to open up the saving account. Uh, when people actually took the opportunity to open up the saving account, uh, the program offered uh, the um, initial uh, amount that was necessary to open up an account. So it was covered by the, by the intervention. Then the deposits were uh, matched on a uh, two to one matching rate. And then uh, people in the treatment group also received a financial training. Um, I want to draw your attention that financial training was provided not only to adolescents, but also to um, their family members, specifically the guardians, their, their caregivers. So pretty much what I did, I uh, had the privilege of having a longitudinal data set. It was a three-year data set, and um, I also had a, a privilege of having a data set not only on, on adolescents, but also their caregivers. Um, and um, um, I had a, a very complicated da data hierarchy, and uh, for the dissertation, I decided to impute the data. I had um, I had about four percent attrition rate at wave two, which was the twelve month follow up, and I had about eight point four percent attrition rate at wave three, which was tw twenty four month follow up, and. Um, uh, I was so excited about this when I was writing, but I think I will. It will be too boring if, <laughs> if I go through data, details now. I just want to briefly say that I use the, general, the generalized estimating equation model. Um, and I use the school fixed effects because the number of schools was not, um, uh, was too small. So um, the, the inter, I think I'm all over the place. So the intervention was, it's a randomized control trial. We had five um, schools in a treatment group, five schools in a control group. Um, uh, control group receives the usual care, um, which uh, was covered in Professor Subamala's presentation earlier. The treatment group received the intervention that I, that I just went through. Um, okay, I think I'm really rushing because I just want to say what I found. So what I found is, my, my basic question is, as a result of participation um, in this uh, match savings account, do families really saved because um, the whole claim is oh assets are great because as a result of um, accumulating assets uh, there's a whole range of psychosocial outcomes children are less depressed they're more confident about their future um, they are uh, less willing to take um, uh, less willing to engage into um, sexual mistaken behavior etc now my question is this claim is great and it has been tested but is it happening because they're actually saving in this? Or this is happening because of some other um, component of this economic and power intervention? So I'm pre pretty much um, testing the first stage, whether this economic and power intervention is actually economically empowering, or, or, or it is doing something else, in, and thus produces this like, social outcome. So OK, the good news is, um, as a result of this intervention, um, um, Adolescents in the treatment group, they actually um, did save more than adolescents in the control group, right? Um, this is a beautiful table, I think. And um, so both the self-reported amounts said, do you have some more uh, adolescents in the treatment group? They said, yes, I have some money saved somewhere. Uh, compared to adolescents in the, in the control group. And actually, the amount reported uh, by adolescents in the, in the treatment group was also higher. Uh, which was beautiful news. Not so beautiful news is that um, there was no change in saving attitude. It's very interesting because usually we assume that uh, intervention changes attitudes and then it changes behavior. But what I found um, was there was no changes in saving um, 
no changes in saving attitude. Now, one of the greatest, biggest limitation in this study is, um, and um, I think uh, this was mentioned earlier by presenter from South Africa, is uh, we have administrative savings only for the treatment group. We unfortunately, and this is the drama of my life, but I, I have a very strong intention to solve it at some point. We don't have uh, administrative data for the control group. Um, but because um, I like Juliet, I'm extremely excited about randomized control trial, and I think this is very fancy. So I really wanted to use, uh, to take advantage of randomized control trial. And that's why I use the self-reported data on saving. The, but then I decided to test whether there is a correlation between self-reported data and administrative data. And as I mentioned in one of my presentations, it, it was really one of the happiest moments in my dissertation when I actually found the correlation. So there is a, a, there is a, a signif statistically significant correlation between the self-reported saving uh, and, and, and administrative saving, um, both in terms of uh, do you have money saved, yes, no, and in terms of the amount saved. So the amount saved was also significantly correlated. Uh, there was a correlation between self-reported and administrative data. The very interesting moment is, um, so we had self-reported um, savings, re savings reported by adolescents and savings reported by guardian. And we had administrative data on saving, which was the data from the child savings accounts. Now what's very interesting, and because we have no time, we will talk about it maybe. <laughs> Um, after a, a bottle of wine at the dinner. But um, what's very interesting is there is no correlation between uh, administrative data and data reported, self-reported data by adolescents. So when adolescents report data, there is no correlation with administrative data. But when guardians report the savings, there is a correlation. And we can speculate about it, what does it mean? Maybe it means that it's not adolescents, but it's, it's guardians who are saving. Maybe it's uh, maybe uh, adolescents do not know how much money are are saved in their child savings accounts. We can talk about it. Okay, future research. Do I have time for future research? Not really. Well, actually, I don't want. I uh, yeah, I actually didn't want to overwhelm everyone because um, there were so many. There are so many questions that we still need to to um, uh, study and research, and and this is beautiful. But I kind of at some point I kind of felt, oh, I want to talk about more about answers than, than questions. So okay, um, and. Um, Acknowledgement. So, Professor Suwamala was my sponsor, um, and as I mentioned earlier, Michael Sheridan was in my dissertation committee, um, uh, and I kind of was um, daring enough to test his institutional theory of saving. And um, the study uh, was funded by National um, Institute of Health, and pretty much every second person sitting um, in this conference contributed to, to the study. Jennifer Natabi, Leila Ismailova, Professor uh, McKay, uh, Vilma, who, oh, Julia, and um, yeah. Okay, questions. Thank you. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Um, it's quite interesting that um, you just said that, um, Leila, that they, but you found a correlation between the money, the administrative money put in their accounts and the attitude to saving or the saved amounts. What I'm trying to know is that, would you say that um, the, the participants were saving because they had money being put in their account, or did the project encourage them to start saving or to continue saving, or did it even imbibe the habit of saving in them?
So you think they would have saved anyway or as a result of the intervention? I believe my findings, um, they save precisely because of, the, of this intervention. So do and you think they'll, yeah. they'll continue to save or is it that because they felt their funds would be matched? I mean, they, they put money there so that they would have their fund money and they have double and you know, they can collect it later on. That's or do you think that they have learned the habit of saving? Yeah. Uh, well, um, to answer this question um, very accurately, I think we would need to collect um, probably a long-term data to see whether they keep saving after the graduation from the inter or there's no graduation from the intervention. The intervention ends at three, after three years, and, and it's interesting to know whether they keep saving. We don't, we don't have that follow-up data. Yay. <laughs> um, I, Dr. Finn has probably already reported this in a presentation that I've probably seen before, but I forget. But I wonder about the cost of the intervention and if the aggregate amount of money saved by the kids was more or less than the cost of the intervention. Does that make sense? Yeah. Well, uh, I will. Uh, is, that, okay. is that to me? Go or? Ahead. Okay. <laughs> I'm kind of hijacking, you know. Um, so um, um, the, the question about the cost of inter intervention, I believe, will be answered by Julia sometime when she, when she finishes her cost-benefit analysis. Um, what I can tell is they saved about um, $3 per month per participant. The average number of months when the account was opened was about 18, so which means that on average, totally, they saved about um, $54.72. And then after being matched, it was about $164, which may seem um, a very little amount. But to compare, the cost of uh, education in Uganda is about um, 65,000 shillings per term, which means that the amount that was saved in child savings account would be enough to cover about four or five terms of post-primary uh, education. So I don't know if, if it makes sense, yeah. Okay, so when you were talking about the discrepancy between the the reporting of the administrative data and the, the self-reporting. So the children, did they under-report or did they over-report oh, versus a, the parents? And I was wondering in terms of what Sylvia was saying, because she said that sometimes parents or guardians um, removed money. So I was wondering if that had any relationship, um, because if there was a safeguard that maybe children had to sign off on withdrawals if there was a way to you know, protect that money built into the program in the future or something. Great question. Maybe we can cluster these, these last okay. few. I had one question for you also, which is um, uh, in not finding the correlation between the child's report measures and the administrative data, is that because there was so little variation among the child's attitudinal? measures like we're all children like I think savings is great so you just couldn't decipher if it was meaningful or is there variation and it just doesn't correspond and my question is to Julie because you mentioned that there were no uh, intervention effects on child well-being as reported by the parents what about by reported by the kids themselves because um, it was somewhere on your slide but it didn't go over it so I was curious and the reason I'm asking it because it seems like you tried to explain the lack of findings because of the intervention, whether or you know the follow-up wasn't too long, maybe you know, we just kind of achieved some intermediate outcomes and it wasn't enough time to affect the long-term outcomes. But I was wondering if it was also the measurement issues because at least when we were looking at some data from the SUBI study, it seems that parents' data of child behavior, especially emotional issues and mental health issues, they're not correlated with child responses. So that's why I'm curious if parents are actually are accurate reporters of what's happening with the child, how the child feels. So it's not really, I mean, is it really a question of the, me uh, of the intervention or whether it's a question of the measurement and who's reporting? 
I don't know if um, uh, if uh, guardians underreported or overreported. I will need to look back into my data f to, to to say that. But I can I can actually look up and say um, maybe later. Um, uh, I wouldn't. I wouldn't actually make any conclusion about um, uh, gardens withdrawing money and kind of without children not knowing it, etc. Um, I I wasn't looking into that. But what I was looking into, although um, there is a variable in the data set which says uh, whether, uh, which allows me to understand whether children know that their garden saves for them or they don't know. So I had that variable, and interestingly, um, this variable was affected by the intervention, so more children in the treatment group knew that guardians is saving them for them than children in the uh, in control group, maybe because guardians in the treatment group were actually saving more, and that's what, so it's really difficult to say, is it because guardians were actually saving for them, or because th there's a knowledge component? You know, one thing is you're saving, another thing is you're actually letting the child know that you're saving for him. So one thing is, is is actual fact of saving. Another thing is is the financial family financial socialization when you know people within the, within the family they, they talk about it. So um, that's the variable that I was looking at, and um, it, there was a, a, a little mediating potential mediating effect for that. So and then. Um, once again, I'm not looking into correlation between attitudes and 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 and, and administrative saving. I'm looking into correlation between administrative saving. Um, so, I'm, so there is a child saving account. So I know that whether the account was active, was open, and the deposit was made in it. Yes, no. And what's the amount saved on that child savings account? That's my administrative data. It comes straight for the bank. My self-reported data, I'm asking the child and the guardian, do you have any money saved? Yes. If yes, then how much money do you have saved? And the child tells me. So that's, that's the correlation. So I was looking at the correlation between self-reported data on savings and administrative data on savings, not, not on the attitudes. Big question yeah. before, which is, was, was there active being changed because of over time? Oh, that's another question. Yeah, that's another question. Oh, oh, I see. Um, yes, th that was one of the possible explanation in, in that I kind of was uh, rambling around in dissertation. That, but it, it, they were initially high, and they kept being high. So it, it is possible that they've already been high. Yeah, so on, on the measurement, I think, so the idea to survey both the caregiver and the child was really to be able to triangulate the data. And uh, unfortunately, I think we didn't um, plan on doing an, a survey that was as extensive for children as for households. So that's why I kind of treat these two sources a bit differently. So the caregiver survey was really with everyone as, as both cycles. So we have more power, it's more representative, etc. The child survey was for a smaller number of children and just for the first cycle. So it's hard to really, uh, but the truth is that they differ in terms of their answers. Um, I think it can be both, right? It's a, maybe a measurement um, issue. So it's not really, we don't ask uh, the parents of, on the attitude of the child. We, I mean, we ask clear question of how many meals a day did the child eat, how many, um, you know, the, on the clothes, on, on things that the caregiver has information about. But you're right, they might be just um, also, the child know maybe better how he feels than the caregiver and so I think there's, on the self-report bias that I talked about before, it was really important for us to survey both because the parents were in an intervention where they were told that it was about parenting. Um, so I guess what I would have imagined uh, from outside would have been that if we would have seen a, an impact, it would have been from the caregiver that kind of knew what, we were, what type of answer we were expecting from them, and that was not the case. So. But yeah, we're still with these two sources, and we, it's hard to explain uh, why are, why do they differ. It would be very interesting to replicate the analysis. So we're actually doing, on the parenting piece, we have another uh, impact evaluation in Thailand that find more positive results, and that came after. So yeah, if you're interested, I can share it with you. <laughs>